10 freaking eShop games worth buying. I've done four of these videos already. This is the fifth one and by golly gosh, this is my favorite one so far. By golly gosh. Believe me when I say this has been the hardest list to make out of any of them because I wanted to make sure that every game was super entertaining, that every game was fun to play, that everyone watching could find at least one game on this list that they would actually want to go out and play. And thankfully, the eShop managed to get some of the best games from 2017, late last year and early this year. The eShop's really stepped its game up recently. And so with all that being said, this is 10 more eShop games for the Nintendo Switch that are worth buying. And there's only one more thing that you have to do. Like, comment, and subscribe to win a Mario cereal. I'm not kidding. Like, comment, and subscribe. And I'm sending out one of these to one of y'all lucky winners. Let's get started. I already recorded this video once. It took me over an hour and a half, and then I realized the microphone wasn't turned on. I recorded the entire thing with no audio, so I'm having to redo it right now, and I can't tell you how much I hate that. So let's put on that happy face and do this one more time. Damn it. I want to come right out the gate swinging and talk about one of my favorite games that was released in 2017, and that's Fury. Fury is a mix of two kind of games. On one side you have a twin stick bullet hell style game, and on the other side you have sword play that relies heavily on parrying. The kind of style of this game lends easily to something like Nier Automata, where you blast through all these levels destroying minions and enemies and waves and waves and waves. This game could easily have gone that way, but it's actually not. Every battle in this game is just one big boss battle, and I love it so much. This game does not take it easy on you, but the gameplay is actually pretty simple. There's only four things you really have to worry about. Attacking with your sword, parrying with your sword, shooting, and dodging. But it's finding the right mesh of those things at the right time that's really important. And that's hard when you just have everything being thrown at you. This game reminds me so much of something like Dragon Ball Z, both in the gameplay where you could be zipping around each other, dodging and parrying and attacking, and going so crazy that if anyone was watching you, it'd be like Krillin watching Goku and Cell fight and not really not knowing what the heck's going on. Every one of these boss fights, the enemy has a health bar and you have a health bar, kind of like Street Fighter. Every time you take down one of the boss's health bars, he goes into the next stage where things get more difficult and more amped up and you rinse and repeat until you manage to actually take him down. But on the other side, if the boss depletes your health bar, you'll have to start that wave again. And if if you fail a wave three times, you have to go all the way back to the start and try the whole fight again. That's when it gets really infuriating. But a pro tip, master that counter. If you can master the parry and you can get good at it, the rest of the game will actually be fairly easy, as, as easy as this game can be. Something else I really like about this game is in between the really intense boss battles, there's this walking stage where you just casually walk. In fact, you can even choose to auto walk where you just sit back and watch this character walk through the level into the next stage, and the stages can get so trippy and mind-bending, and sometimes they just look really pretty. That contrast between extreme action where you're just sweating and frustrated and you just wanna pull your hair out because you keep dying, and then all of a sudden there's just an auto walk and you're just kind of taking in the scenery. There's such an extreme contrast, but I love it. While I'm fighting an enemy, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to that passive walk, and I'm looking forward to that cooldown, and while I'm cooling down, it's amping me up for the next fight. It's such a nice contrast and give and take. So if you're up for a challenge, and just a really great game, as I said, one of the best ones to come out of 2017, I'm really happy Fury's on the Switch. Next up we have a game called Gun House, and this game is really unique. I haven't ever seen anything quite like it before. Kind of like how in Fury the game is a mesh of two styles of gameplay, in Gun House you also have two styles. One style is a tower defense game, and the other style is a puzzle matchup game. This game surprised me in a couple ways. First, I don't really like tower defense games or puzzle matchup games, so I'm like, I'm not gonna like this. Turns out, I actually like it a lot. And the next way was, well, I mean, I'll play it a little bit and you get a feel for it. Turns out I got addicted to it and I played it a lot. When a level starts, you'll start on the puzzle matchup side and you'll try and match up colored blocks to build as big a blocks as possible. And when you've built a block, you can swipe it to the left or to the right. If you swipe it to a left, you'll build a gun or a torrent. If you slide it to the right, you'll build an AOE nuke. And depending on the color and the icon on the block will depend on what you actually build. Maybe a boomerang weapon, maybe it'll be an ice weapon that will slow down the enemies, or maybe just a fireball for extreme damage. And then when your time runs up on the puzzle side, the tower defense side kicks in and you start getting bombarded with all these enemies. And that's when you start using the weapons you created. You either tap or select on the guns or the AOEs and try and defend your gun house. And then after you use up your weapons and a certain time pass, is you'll flip back to the puzzle mechanic and you'll go again. You'll try and match up some more. And that's where you start getting strategic and seeing what's coming and what you need to build or what you at least need to try to build or at least struggle to build in the time you have and keep going back and forth. And as 
as I said, it actually gets really addictive and these two styles of gameplay work together really well. I also really like the art style of this game, the hand-drawn style. All the enemies remind me of enemies from Cuphead. They're all very unique and there are a ton of different kinds. It's a really fun game and as I said, I got addicted to it. Guns, Gore, and Cannoli has to be the best Metal Slug style game I've played since Metal Slug. First off, I love the cartoony style of the game. I love the fact that it's set in the 1920s and you play as a gangster named Cannoli. The cutscenes are actually fun to watch and pretty humorous. Everything about the game just screams you're gonna have a good time. But those are all things I like about the game. You know what I love about the game? Variation. And the variation comes in two forms. One, the weapons, and two, the enemies. Let's look at the weapons first. When I say variation, I don't mean a ton of different weapons, which you have. You have a ton of different weapons. But what I mean in variation is every weapon feels different. If you're using a shotgun, you know you're using a shotgun. It feels heavy and you blow the enemies away. And every weapon manages to have its own feel, have its own advantages and disadvantages. My favorite weapon is this giant pistol which reminds me of the golden gun from 007 or a desert eagle in Resident Evil where it pretty much one hits everything and takes their head off. And then you have the enemy variation where it's not only different sprites and I will mention the sprites look really great, but if you take just the zombies, you have small zombies, big zombies, huge fat zombies that'll run through you and shotguns won't slow them down. You have zombies that'll crawl, you have zombies that'll spray things out of their face. And then you also have human enemies, enemies with guns, enemies that'll shoot back at you. And then you'll have humans and zombies at the same time, you have to try and deal with both. And then you'll have boss battles to deal with as well. This game recently had a sequel announced and I can definitely see why. I'm having a lot of fun with it. Kim and I recently were at a parent's house, we were kind of bored. And this is why I love the Switch because I only took one controller, obviously the Joy-Cons. Pulled those bad boys off, split them in half, handed one to her. And we sat there playing it just one Joy-Con each and honestly it works just great that way. There's definitely a lot of guns, there's definitely a lot of gore and the main guy's name is Cannoli and you eat Cannoli to heal yourself so it has a lot of Cannoli. The next game on the list was by far the biggest surprise to me. It was the one that I thought for sure I probably wouldn't like, but then ended up being the one I played the most. I played this game so much that if you knew how much, you'd probably think I was weird. And that game is 60 seconds. It's a lot of fun, it's addictive. The game is called 60 seconds because when you start, an atomic bomb warning is going off and you have 60 seconds to grab as much stuff in the house as you can and throw it into the bomb shelter. So your wife, your daughter, your son, an axe, a med kit, some food, some water, what Whatever it is near you that you can see that you think you might need to survive the end of the world, grab it and get to that bunker in 60 seconds. And then you start the bulk of the gameplay where you have your family, whoever it is that you saved, all the items, all the food, all the water, you can see it all and you're given a journal and day by day you have to decide who gets the food, who gets the water, who goes out to scavenge and try and get more stuff. You'll have situations thrown at you each day like you have people knocking on your door asking for food and you have to decide whether or not you can spare a can of food or a bottle of water. I very quickly got addicted to trying to see how many days I could last and the, and the most I've done is 70 and trust me that took me a lot of tries. I started to figure out that I didn't have to feed everyone every day. I figured out I didn't have to scavenge every day. If anyone actually watching this gets this game and manages to get past 70 days feel free to tweet it to me and let me know because I'm trying to beat my record and I can't. The only thing I would want to add to this game is that initial mechanic of walking around and trying to grab as much as you can is actually pretty fun but you only do it that one time at the start each time you play the game. And I feel like it's a whole mechanic that's wasted. You have people go up to scavenge, let me go up and scavenge. Let me go grab that med kit I missed the first time that's been bugging me the last 60 days. That would be the only thing I would add, but I still got addicted to it. So I recommend checking it out, it's pretty cheap. I don't want to sound like a broken record and keep saying, this game surprised me, this game surprised me. But Max the Curse of Brotherhood, it surprised me. And it's not because I thought it was going to be bad. In fact, it's been out for a while and I always thought I would enjoy it. The story is great and it's told through this Pixar style animation that could rival something like the first Incredibles movie. And even the character design is really good. One of the first monsters you see is awesome. I love the way he looks. I love that style. It actually reminds me of the creatures and the monsters that Kim makes and puts on Etsy. So as soon as I saw that and she saw that looking over my shoulder, we were both in love with this game. And it only got better from there. I'd seen the gameplay of this game before. I understood that it was a side-scrolling platformer, but as soon as I started playing it, I was like, damn, this is action-packed. It feels like playing an Uncharted game, but 2D side-scroller version. You slide, you swing, you jump, you climb, and it's all so fast-paced and you just keep moving. It never feels like there's slowdown. The only time that you slow down and stop to do anything is when you're solving puzzles, and even the puzzles are really fun. And shortly into the game, you unlock the unique thing about this game, which is the pen. The pen is filled with magic ink that lets you interact with the game and the environment, such as building platforms out of the ground. And that adds into the challenge 
challenge of platforming because now not only are you trying to aim for platforms that exist, but you have to build your own while you're swinging. Again, this game is really great. From the story to the animation to the gameplay, it never seems to slow down and it got more and more entertaining as I was playing. I knew I was going to like this game. I didn't know I was going to love this game. Now, as a grown adult man, or at least I like to tell myself that, I really enjoyed the next two games. But I will say that if you have a kid, I highly recommend downloading these games because these next two games will involve having your brain at full power, being as creative as you possibly can. And not only was that really fun for me, but that's great for a kid. The first one is Polybridge. In each level of Polybridge, you'll have vehicles that need to get from point A to point B, and it's your job to build a bridge strong enough to have them get across it safely. It sounds easy, but of course, not always. In most levels, you're free to be as creative as you want. You can build a straight up bridge as long as it's sturdy enough to get them from point A to point B and call it a day. But do you want to get creative? Do you want to build a ramp and have that car shoot to the other side? Do you want to build a freaking loop to loop and have that car go around it before it gets to the other side? That's really up to you. But I will say if you start building loop de loops, you'll probably go over your budget and then you won't get three stars on the level. And that's where another challenge comes into play is trying to keep your bridges under budget. And sometimes you'll just get there. You'll build a bridge and you'll be over. You have to start taking parts of the bridge away and hoping that it's stable enough that you'll still get the car across, but you'll still get that star for staying under budget. But that's a challenge to go for if you want to get all three stars per level. On some levels, you'll be thrown actual challenges. Like maybe a boat will be coming through the level at some point and you'll have to build hydraulics to lift the road up. The game will start throwing challenges at you that will actually limit your creativity as far as being able to build anything you want but then that's when your brain kicks into overdrive and you have to be super creative trying to find a way to make it work the way the game wants it to or which way can I cheat and do this without the game realizing that I did it the wrong way having it on the tablet and being able to switch between your materials at a touch of a button or being able to draw a line and build a bridge with your finger I can't imagine not having those mechanics and playing this on anything else at this point so whether you're an adult or you have a kid or you are a kid Polybridge is a great idea. And another great idea for a similar reason is Draw a Stickman Epic 2. This game has you start by drawing your own character and you can be as creative as you want. You can literally draw anything. For me, I just drew a stick man and then later on I realized I wanted a better looking stick man. So throughout the game, you can draw more and you can switch out whenever you want. I saw someone drew a Mario to play with and then drew Bowser as the bad guy. Or if you want to be really immature, you can even draw one of those and play as one of those. I'm not recommending it, I'm saying you can. You can do anything. That's the great thing about the game. <laughs> Even things like when you come across items you need, like a pickaxe, you don't just find a pickaxe, you get to draw your own pickaxe and use that one. So that's where the creativity comes into it, but then where the brain power comes into it is using the drawing technique throughout the levels to complete certain goals, like drawing leaves on trees to open up paths, or drawing wires to connect electricity so you can use levers to get through certain places. Depending on the situation, you have to draw around the enemies and use objects around you to attack the enemies and damage them that way. Now this game's pretty cheap. It's not the most intense game out there. It's not the most in-depth game out there. It can get kind of challenging at times, like when you're trying to draw all those wires to connect certain things and figuring out what's supposed to go where. But for the most part, it's just a light, fun little title that you can mess around with and draw whatever you want. I've always loved that kind of aspect of being able to just draw something and oh, here's my character now. For those that watched my 10 PlayStation Network games worth buying, I talked about a game called Gang Beasts. You play as characters that kind of drunkenly stumble around and you control the arms and you try and throw characters out of the ring. Well, take that gameplay mechanic, take those characters and put them into a world where you need to complete challenges and levels and you have human full flat and you can control each arm independently and grab things. And then you gotta try and do things like platforming, jumping drunkenly from platform to platform and grabbing the edge and trying to pull yourself up, or trying to press a button to open a door as long as you can actually get your arm to go in the right place. Essentially doing a lot of things you do on a regular platformer, but doing it like you're drunk. You can also play this game in co-op if you wanna to add to the extreme chaos. It actually makes it a lot harder, but again, a lot funner. And no matter how much fun you have playing this game, I can guarantee if you have someone watching you, they will find it 10 times funnier than you. So imagine if John Marston from Red Dead Redemption 2 walked into the bar, got really drunk, walked outside, and suddenly he was in Crash Bandicoot. Human in full flat. <laughs> Blossom Tales is a game that everyone kept telling me to play. You gotta play Blossom Tales, you gotta play Blossom Tales because it's so much like Link to the Past. And it is, it is pretty much Link to the Past. Blossom Tales even references Link to the Past at the start of the game and then throughout the rest of the game. The two main differences is the game's obviously much shorter than Link to the Past. It's eight hours, which ain't bad for a game like this on the eShop. You have four big dungeons, each with boss fights, the whole shebang. And the combat is essentially exactly the same. The only difference is the combat in Blossom Tales is more floaty it's almost like you're on ice 
a little bit slippery, a little more slippery, I should say. And I like that. I definitely prefer the precision of Link to the Past, and I in no way prefer this It Blossom Tales. But it's not bad, and it's still really fun to play, and it's different. It's not exactly a carbon copy from every aspect. It actually feels different to play, so that's good. As I said, there are boss fights, and they're actually pretty fun. A pro tip for this game is use the bombs on the bosses. It makes it so much easier. But overall, it's a fun little title. If you like Link to the Past, this one's an absolute no-brainer. You will like this one. You'll, you'll have to be being stubborn to not like it because it's essentially the same thing. Well, as they say, end with a bang, and I think I would get yelled at if I didn't talk about Steam World Heist. In this game, you play as a space scrapper traveling through the galaxy fighting enemies to gain water and loot. In this game, water works a similar way like bottle caps do in Fallout, and I'm now realizing that was a really weird way to explain that. Was it? Maybe I'm tired. It may not look good at first, but this game is actually a turn-based shooter. It requires you to be extremely tactical at times, even being able to ricochet bullets off the walls and ceilings, which feels really badass, by the way. At the end of the levels, check your loot and see what weapons, characters, and armors you have found along your way. Your characters level up and unlock new abilities as you play. That rhymed. And in the Switch version of this game, you have all the DLC and you can play it entirely with touch controls. So I would say probably the best way to play this game, but I'll let you be the judge. I enjoy all the Steam World games and this one was fantastic. So there is another 10 eShop games worth buying that I had to record twice. And let me tell you, it wasn't very fun. I hope, I hope the fact that I had to do this warrants a like and a subscribe on this video. Also, if you comment, like, and subscribe, you will hopefully win a Mario Odyssey cereal. I'm going to be giving a few away over the next few weeks. Let me know down below what you thought of the video, if you liked the games I listed, or if you have your own that maybe I could put in a future video. I appreciate you. I love you. I, I, I do. Otherwise, I wouldn't get up here and I wouldn't film this entire thing again. Let me see. Let me see if my... It, an hour. I've been recording for an hour. That's... And that, that was me going into this one knowing what I was going to say because I already did it once before and it still took an hour to redo it. My throat hurts. I'll see you guys in the next video.